gift <laughs> that I got when I gave a colloquium here, and I think it was 2007 in the fall or somewhere around then. Uh, and and uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be back and see uh, see many good friends and colleagues. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the big open questions at the intersection of nuclear physics, high energy physics, and cosmology, which is why does the universe have more matter than antimatter? And uh, just to put that in context, let me start with this picture that is, I think, probably well known to everybody. It is the pie chart of the energy density of the universe. And what we know about that uh, energy density is that about 5% of the energy is, is baryonic uh, matter, what we're made out of. 27% uh, is dark matter, and 68% is the dark energy. And it would seem to me that we can't explain this picture yet, and so explaining it, and explaining really the origin, the identity, and the relative fractions of the cosmic energy budget is, I think, one of the most compelling motivations for thinking about physics beyond the standard model of fundamental interactions. Uh, so I'm going to focus on one of the three pieces of that budget, the smallest one. It's often taken for granted that we exist, but we really can't explain, you know, apart from theology, why we exist. And so uh, that's the quest for uh, fundamental physics, is to explain all of these pieces. And I'm going to focus on the baryonic piece, which is uh, what we're made out of. Uh, and what we'll discuss today is that explaining this non-vanishing baryonic component requires determining which fundamental symmetries in the early universe were present and how they were broken. And we'll discuss that in, in some detail. And I'm also going to make contact with experiment, and I'm going to try to illustrate how two classes of experiments at very different energy scales uh, can bear on this question of where the baryonic matter came from. Uh, at the very highest energies, the Large Hadron Collider, and at very low energy, searches for something called permanent electric dipole moments of things like the neutron or neutral atom uh, are providing uh, equally important information. So fundamental symmetries, in case uh, this is not a topic of uh, at the forefront of your mind, so let me remind you what fundamental symmetries are. Um, there are two classes. There are the so-called discrete symmetries, parity, charge conjugation, time reversal, baryon number. Uh, the list goes on and on. Parity, just to take one example, I remind you, is a uh, transformation that takes inverts the coordinates through the origin. And under that uh, transformation, spins don't change sign, but uh, uh, ordinary vectors do. Um, the other class of symmetries that we'll discuss are the continuous symmetries. The things like quantum electrodynamics have U1 symmetry. There's the weak isospin of the standard model, color SU3 of the standard model, et cetera. Uh, and these symmetries correspond to transformations of fundamental fields or wave functions in uh, particle physics uh, where the characteristic um, parameter is a continuous function of uh, space time, alpha. So these two kinds of symmetries, their presence and their violation, I think are key to understanding the origin of baryonic matter. I also want to put this topic in the context of recent developments uh, in fundamental physics. Uh, and we have to start with the discovery of the what we think is the Higgs boson. Uh, and to my mind, the most important feature of this discovery is not that the last piece of the standard model was put into the place. The, the pieces of the puzzle seem to be all fitting in there but rather that the paradigm uh, that the Higgs boson represents uh, of symmetry breaking associated with a fundamental scalar field in particle physics is likely correct. And so that, I think, opens up for us a way of thinking even more broadly about the symmetries of the early universe and their relationship in particle physics. On the other hand, we haven't seen anything else so far at the energy frontier that's beyond the standard model. So what are the implications of that fact? And these low energy searches for permanent electric dipole moments of uh, quantum mechanical systems have not seen anything other than zero uh, now for decades. And so what is the uh, implication of that non-observation? So in the rest of the talk, and I'll try to come to these points. I'll start with a little bit of the context for the question, cosmic history. I'll talk about the ways we can go about experimentally uh, trying to find some clues. You know, I'm a theorist, uh, but I, I take a lot of uh, information from experiment. And then I'll focus um, very much on the origin of matter question uh, 
starting with some general considerations. I'll focus on the ties to the era of electroweak symmetry breaking and the question of a symmetry called CP. So let me start with cosmic history. And I'm going to start with this uh, propaganda slide from the particle data group. This is the history of the universe. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is the Big Bang, where we started. And down here is where we are today. These axes, which you can't read, uh, correspond to time, or the temperature of the universe from hot to cold, or energy from high to low. And so going from the beginning to today in time is corresponding to lower and lower energies or lower and lower temperatures. So what I like to do is divide this uh, history into certain eras. Starting when the universe was about 10 picoseconds old, right here, uh, is the era when the symmetries of the standard model and their, their broken nature uh, do a very good job of describing most of the microphysics of the universe. And we can take that history and divide it into certain chapters. Uh, starting when the universe was about uh, 10 to the 10 microseconds old uh, is the era when the quarks and the gluons were confined into hadrons. And many people here are studying uh, the physics of how that happened. Much later on, minutes after the Big Bang, is when the hadrons, neutrons and protons, were confined into atomic nuclei. And then a much longer time later, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, was the formation of large-scale structure uh, that leads to our existence, uh, stars, planets, galaxies, and so, and so forth. So the standard model does a very good job of describing the microphysics of these various eras in cosmic history. Uh, we now know, uh, with the discovery of the Higgs, that the standard model symmetries were broken around 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. What else do we know? Well, going back in time, one other piece of the puzzle that is probably correct, uh, at least so far, is the idea of inflation uh, uh, as uh, being responsible for the isotropy and homogeneity of the universe. Um, and that's about it. We know, on the other hand, that there are open questions that what is shown on this slide can't explain. And that calls for new interactions or new forces or new symmetries beyond those of the standard model. And uh, so I'm going to go into those in some detail. But I want to start with what it is we really love from a theoretical point of view about the standard model and, and its uh, uh, sort of underpinnings. Uh, foremost, I think, is that it utilizes a very simple and elegant symmetry principle to explain the microphysics of uh, the later part of the uh, cosmic history. And that's a principle that involves a series of groups, continuous symmetry groups, color, weak isospin, and hypercharge uh, that organizes the way the elementary particles that we know uh, interact. Um, and, and I've already alluded to the fact that a lot of astrophysics and other phenomena in, the, in today's universe can be explained based on these uh, interactions. Uh, the standard model also purports to solve the question of how the symmetries are broken. We know that the latter two symmetries are not good symmetries today, and their breaking has resulted into the symmetry of quantum electrodynamics, another continuous symmetry. And that is associated with the Higgs mechanism. And just to remind you again, if you haven't been thinking about this recently, the idea is that the Higgs field gets a ground state matrix element or vacuum expectation value in the universe, and all elementary particle masses are proportional to that matrix element. Okay, so the origin of elementary particle masses are associated with this symmetry breaking. But there are still open questions. Is the Higgs boson that's associated with the symmetry breaking actually the one that we expect based on uh, the standard model expectations? Or is it somewhat different? And is it the only one? Is there possibly more than one Higgs-like uh, boson uh, that is yet to be discovered? Those are questions that are really under the purview of the energy frontier. And of course, um, right at our doorstep is the uh, possibility that we'll get some answers from experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, on the other hand, there are questions or puzzles the standard model just can't solve. I've listed some of them here. Uh, the one I'm focusing on today is the origin of the baryonic matter as well as the dark matter. Uh, but there are other things that we can't really square within the standard model. Uh, how is gravity unified with the other forces of nature? Why is the time at which symmetry was broken in the standard model 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang actually so late? There are good reasons to think it ought to have been much earlier. So what stabilizes that late time? It's weak scale stability. And then the properties of neutrinos. 
uh, are are difficult to account for within the minimal standard model, as at least written down by Glashow, Weinberg, and Salon. So these questions call for these existence of new forces or interactions. And there are many ideas that have been around for a while. Supersymmetry, which postulates what are called super partners for all the standard model particles, may have been around. And those particles may have been around in this early universe soup. Uh, grand unified theories that postulate other partners of standard model force carriers. Uh, more recently, ideas that maybe we live in extra space-time dimensions that look to us like uh, excited states of standard model particles. And then the properties of the neutrino seem to point to the existence of what are thought to be very heavy partners of the active neutrinos today that may have been active in this early universe soup. So are any of these ideas right? Uh, and do they solve these problems uh, that the standard model can't solve? That's really the quest, it seems to me, for fundamental physics uh, in many respects today. So I'm going to focus on the origin of matter. And this is a particularly exciting time to address this question because the experiments at the energy frontier and uh, the low energy experiments are really probing interactions that are relevant at what is what called the Terra scale, or this in times after the Big Bang, this 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang uh, era. And so the, uh, well, let, me, let me back up here. Yeah, OK. So um, to put this into context then with the, with the origin of matter problem, um, why is it a problem? Well, so we think that certainly at the Big Bang, the universe was, was most likely matter-antimatter symmetric. So there were equal numbers of positrons and electrons, or quarks and antiquarks that were annihilating back and forth into radiation and so forth. Uh, certainly by the end of inflation, we think that was likely to be the case. Uh, but somehow, by the time we got to the 10 microsecond era, when uh, confinement occurred in quantum chromodynamics, there had to be more quarks than antiquarks. So how did we go from uh, sort of a democratic situation uh, to an imbalance by the time we got to the QCD uh, confinement phase transition? That's the problem of explaining the origin of matter. Now, this problem is characterized by a number, y sub b, which is the ratio of the baryon number density to the entropy density of, of the universe associated with photons. And that number is actually very small. Uh, there aren't a lot of baryons compared to photons, but baryons are massive, so they give a lot of the energy density. And that number is of order 10 to the minus 10. And, and as I'll tell you a little later on, we know that number from a couple of different sources uh, uh, and are quite confident in that value. So how did this non-zero number arise? Well, this getting something from nothing is called baryogenesis. And but basically, we have open questions about baryogenesis. When did it occur? Probably the latest time would have been around the era of electroweak symmetry breaking. It could have been much earlier. Uh, and right now, we don't have any definitive answer as to when. Uh, there had to be a violation of this symmetry called CP. Uh, that's CPV. What is CP? Well, C is a combination of charge conjugation uh, symmetry, uh, where under charge conjugation, particles are turned into antiparticles and the parity symmetry that I alluded to earlier. Uh, to get a non-zero baryon asymmetry, Y sub B, e, uh, CP had to be violated in a much more active way than it is in the standard model. So where was that CP violation? Did it live in one of these things like supersymmetry? Was it associated with neutrinos in the early universe? We have questions, but no definitive answer. These days, there are sort of two uh, very uh, popular and well-studied scenarios associated with this possibility of sort of late time baryogenesis or earlier time baryogenesis. The early time baryogenesis ideas that are most uh, actively discussed these days go under the heading of leptogenesis. Leptogenesis is a way of creating more baryons than antibaryons through interactions involving heavy neutrinos in the early universe. It's difficult to test in laboratory experiments, but one can look for ingredients for leptogenesis um, in laboratories. The other sort of bookend is the weak scale or terra scale or electroweak baryogenesis uh, paradigm. And this is the one I'm going to focus on uh, largely because it's testable with this combination of energy frontier and very high sensitivity, low energy experiments. Just to not offend anyone who has a, you know, an affinity for other baryogenesis scenarios, I'm listing some other possibilities here that are, again, 
mostly not as easily testable. Uh, so you should be aware that these aren't the only ones, but I'm going to be focusing on, on this one because I think we have a chance of either seeing the ingredients uh, very directly or ruling it out and closing off one very important possibility for how the matter was created in the universe. So let's go back to this puzzle. I think I want to put one other point uh, up front before we continue, which is um, back to this idea of the discovery of the Higgs-like boson. As I said, I think it um, tells us that the idea that there was a symmetry breaking associated with a fundamental scalar is likely correct. But now we can ask, was that symmetry breaking as simple as in the standard model paradigm? Uh, was it the only cosmologically relevant phenomena that occurred around this time in cosmic history, 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang? And if the answers are no, then maybe what's missing could be responsible for the origin of matter. And that's really what I'm trying to uh, address in the rest of the talk. So let me now back up a little bit and say a little bit about the sort of experimental approaches to getting clues uh, to the answers to these questions. Uh, and those clues come from three frontiers, what we call three frontiers these days. Um, uh, and the three frontiers really involve the energy frontier, Large Hadron Collider, and people are now even thinking about beyond the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the uh, astrophysical cosmic frontier, uh, which involves sort of the largest distance scales uh, we have at our disposal, and then these very low energy, high sensitivity experiments, uh, which include things like the EDM searches that I'm going to be discussing. Uh, and they're essentially uh, tabletop physics. Much of it is done here at TAMU, for example. Uh, these are a couple of pictures, some of my favorite pictures in physics. Here's a couple of students that are looking for an electric dipole moment of the uh, uh, radium atom, and uh, they're probing through those experiments, very high energy scales. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool uh, that you can compete here with here in some ways, or here. Uh, this one is a picture of a, uh, a detector that's being carried into Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, it's a neutrino mass uh, experiment, a beta decay uh, experiment. This detector is being carried through the village, and you see the crowds of people that have come out to welcome this physics experiment. Uh, I just love it. You know, I wish I wish my theory had that kind of response. <laughs> you know, oh well. Anyway, so so the point is that you know information from all of these frontiers is uh, is important uh, in addressing this question of uh, the origin of matter. And so I think of this problem as really a poster child, sorry, for uh, physics at the intersection of these three uh, frontiers. And so that's why one of the reasons why I find it such a compelling uh, question to be working on. So we'll be learning things and are learning things from the Atlas and CMS. Uh, experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. We will be learning things from electric dipole moment searches. I'll be talking about those two. You should also know that uh, searches for gravity, gravitational radiation, and studies of cosmic microwave background and other astrophysical and cosmic probes can also teach us something in principle about uh, where the matter of the universe came from. But I won't have time in this talk to discuss uh, in any great detail. So let's now go to the origin of matter in, in more detail. And I'm going to start with some general considerations and apply them to the electroweak scenario. So back to our picture. Um, we're focusing on this number. And the first thing we may want to ask is, how do we know it? Um, well, there are two ways we know it. The first is from measurements of the abundance of light elements in the universe today. Um, those measurements can be translated into this number YB through a a framework called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, which is a way of understanding how the light elements were formed from the protons and neutrons minutes after the Big Bang. This is a plot of the abundances of different elements. Uh, this is helium-4. This is uh, deuterium and helium-3. This is lithium-7 uh, as functions of the baryon asymmetry, according to Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. The yellow regions are what we've learned from experiment. The curves are what the Big Bang nucleosynthesis um, uh, construction implies. And the blue is sort of what uh, the best sort of agreement is uh, between all the different measurements. Um, and so that number comes out uh, in the ballpark of this number here. The number I'm actually quoting is coming from what I'll just show you in a minute, which is uh, studies of the cosmic 
excuse me, the microwave background, which is shown by this uh, purple line here, and I'll come to that in a second. But big bang nucleosynthesis, I just want to emphasize, is information about the baryon asymmetry we get from physics associated with minutes after the Big Bang. Now, the cosmic microwave background is another source. And what's measured in the CMB are uh, power spectra, which can be de decomposed in sort of Fourier transforms or multiple decomposition. So this is a, a power temperature power spectrum uh, as a function of where you look in the sky. Uh, it can be decomposed um, in multiple moments. And you get the, typically these kinds of structures like this. One particularly important one for the baryon asymmetry is what's called baryon acoustic oscillation. And you can think of this because the cosmic microwave photons scatter from the baryonic fluid in the universe, right, which is oscillating. Those are the oscillations. And so if you have more baryons, the oscillations are going to be more intense in some ways than, than less baryons. And that sort of shows up in these different curves. So the blue curve at the black, yeah, the blue curve at the top uh, corresponds to a larger baryonic fraction. The red corresponds to a smaller baryonic fraction. And by comparing the peaks and the depths of these different curves, we can infer the value of the baryon asymmetry. That's this number that's quoted here. And that information is really relevant to uh, you know, almost 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So minutes after the Big Bang to 400,000 years from the Big Bang, uh, there's good agreement uh, in what we infer about the baryonic density of the universe. So I think we're pretty confident in what that number is. So where did it come from? So from a fundamental physics point of view, where it came from uh, was sort of laid out in general terms by Andrei Sakharov, a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winner. Uh, and Sakharov told us that there were three ingredients in the particle physics of the early universe that had to be present to explain how we got something from nothing. There had to be violation of the discrete symmetry called baryon number, which is you know, if you conserve the number of baryons, you can never end up with more baryons than antibaryons. So that, that symmetry had to be violated. The symmetry CP had to be violated, as well as charge conjugation uh, symmetry. And the third criteria that Sakharov uh, told us had to be there was that at some point in the universe history, the dynamics had to go out of equilibrium, which is a point that I will come to shortly. So for weak scale baryogenesis, how are these criteria affected? Well, baryon number violation is actually affected through something called a spaleron, which I'll discuss later. It's an anomalous process in, in field theory. The C and CP violation is needed uh, in order to create an imbalance between rates for particles and antiparticles of some sort. And when you do that in the right way, that can cause these anomalous processes to sort of make more baryons than antibaryons. Now, if that's where we stopped, then we'd still have no net baryon asymmetry because you could unmake them. And so something has to freeze in the baryon asymmetry at some point. And that's where the universe had to go out of equilibrium somehow to prevent the washout of the baryon asymmetry. So these three ingredients sort of had to work together in the right way to give us this number of order 10 to the minus 10, or 5% of the energy density of the universe today uh, that we observe. So standard model is good for one piece of it. It has these anomalous processes called spalerons. And don't worry if you don't know what it is, because I'll explain it shortly. Where the standard model fails is in the last two. It doesn't have the violation of the CP symmetry that we need. And the standard model universe never goes out of equilibrium in the way that's needed. And so something beyond the standard model has to have come into play uh, to address these shortcomings. And what I'm going to discuss is how uh, experiments, uh, the electric dipole moments, and experiments at Large Hadron Collider may be pointing us toward what those uh, pieces of new physics were uh, if they existed at the Terra scale or the weak scale. So uh, Large Hadron Collider and EDM, just to emphasize the moment. So let's now start with this third Sakharov criteria, non-equilibrium or, or uh, departure from equilibrium. And let's go back to the picture here. And let's think about how this would have happened at the, the weak scale, uh, 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. So we'll start with a universe that is symmetric with respect to the electroweak symmetries. And at 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang, there was a transition where, as the cosmos cooled, it went from more order or, you know, uh, to a less, uh, went from a, a more symmetric, uh, less ordered universe to a 
more ordered, less symmetric universe, much as occurs in uh, uh, condensed matter systems that, that we're more familiar with. Okay, so the phase transition uh, took place around this time. So the nature of that phase transition is really critically important for understanding this problem. So the way we think about it for a weak scale baryogenesis is that we start with this electroweak symmetric universe. Uh, things are expanding, and at some point, um, the transition occurs, and it occurs through the nucleation of bubbles of broken electroweak symmetry, okay, much as water droplets condense out of steam. Uh, the broken phase condenses out of the symmetric phase around 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. That's how the transition would have to have occurred. Uh, it doesn't, in a standard model universe, behave like this. But if the baryons were made at this time, then this is most likely how it would have to have taken place. If it does, then how do Sakharov's criteria actually work together to make the baryons? Well, we start with the unbroken phase, and let's look at one of those bubbles. Okay. Inside, the symmetries are broken. Outside, the symmetries are unbroken. And, and outside is where these topological processes are taking place in a very uh, unsuppressed sort of way. And now let me explain to you a little more what those are with this cartoon here. It's an oversimplification, but this will give you the idea. This is, oh, you can't even see it. Well, okay, see, now you're going to have to really work hard and wake up. Okay, this is, um, what this is is a, a series of uh, peaks and valleys, a continuous uh, sort of graph uh, as a function on this axis of the uh, precursors of the W and the Z and the photon gauge bosons in electroweak theory. And you can see, well, you can't see, but you, you ought to have been able to see that there are an infinite number of uh, ground states. Okay, These are called Chern-Simons vacua. And the difference between one and the next one over is the total number of baryons plus leptons in the universe. Okay. So uh, what you might imagine is that if you started where there was no net baryon plus lepton number, that through quantum mechanical tunneling, you might move over to the next vacuum and create the universe that we live in. The problem is that the rate for that is so slow that it would never happen on the time scale of the age of the universe. So how do you get to a non-zero baryon plus lepton number? Well, one way is that at finite temperature, you excite uh, configurations of these fields so that you can hop over the barrier. The configuration corresponding to the top of the barrier is called a spaleron. And technical terms for people who are sort of up to speed on field theory is it's a saddle point in the uh, uh, effective action. Um, and so the idea is that at finite temperature, the transitions over the barriers are, are uh, taking place rapidly um, because you're at finite temperature. And it wouldn't happen at zero temperature. But that's not good enough because you could live in any one of these ground states uh, with equal probability. So this is where CP violation comes in. CP violation comes in first through interactions of fields or particles beyond the standard model at the boundaries of the bubble. Uh, and because of the CP violation effect, it creates a net density of some charge that biases these spaleron processes to run in one direction. And you wouldn't have that without the CP violating effect. It's kind of like a seed cause things to twist. But even that's not good enough because eventually things would like to run back up the hill. So you've got to end up here and turn it off before you have a chance to run back up the hill. And that's where you have to have a first order phase transition that is really strong to quench it inside the bubble. Testability. CP violation can be tested with these electric dipole moment systems. And the idea here, if we think in terms of uh, of cartoons is I have an electron in my system that can fluctuate into the same new fields that live in the early universe. The interactions violate the symmetry here and here. They're the same ones. And so by seeing the effect of this CP violation on the tabletop, you're probing the CP violation in the early universe. What about this phase transition picture? Well, there we have to look for new particles at the energy frontier that behave in some ways like the Higgs boson. And I'll discuss that in some detail shortly. So as I said, it's a really, I think, fabulous um, marriage between the experiments at the highest energies and the experiments at very high sensitivity and low energies to try to probe what may have been happening in this way 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. 
So let's talk about those probes and some of the ideas for what might be seen in the remaining time that I have. And I'm going to start with the phase transition, how electroweak symmetry is broken, and the possibility that there were new particles like the Higgs, scalars, uh, that may have done the job. Now we should start by, again, sort of, um, you know, tipping our hats to the, the discovery of the Higgs, which is really a fantastic uh, achievement uh, in the last uh, few years. Um, and people have measured the properties of the Higgs, in particular the way it decays to various final states. Uh, this is just a, a summary of uh, what we've learned from the CMS and ATLAS collaborations about the Higgs properties. These are the different decay modes of the Higgs. The details aren't important for you. What's important is this dotted line here, uh, which is the strength of those decays relative to standard model expectations. And this is the data. And from CMS, there's very good agreement uh, with standard model expectations. From ATLAS, this dotted line represents the same thing. And by and large, except for one little outlier here, where the Higgs is decaying to two photons, there's very good agreement uh, with the standard model. This one is, uh, is uh, a little bit uh, off here. But basically, it looks a lot like the Higgs. Okay? So if this is all we had around, why can't we get uh, uh, a first order phase transition? Well, to think about that, I need to show you this cartoon here which is the sort of simple picture of describing the way a phase transition occurs. What's plotted is the free energy of the universe as a function of this vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. And on the left, we'll start with that picture, uh, there are a series of curves that correspond to lower and lower temperatures. At high temperature, uh, we start where the minimum of the energy is at the origin, where the Higgs has no vacuum expectation value, and therefore the symmetry is a good symmetry in the standard model. As the temperature cools, then a secondary minimum develops at a temperature called the critical temperature. It's got the same energy as the symmetric minimum. And at lower temperatures, it becomes the lowest energy state. And the universe likes to end up over here. This evolution described on the left is uh, characteristic of what's called a first order phase transition. And importantly, there's a barrier between the two minima in that transition. Now it turns out. Uh, in that kind of situation, once you cool below the critical temperature, uh, the universe then likes to tunnel to the broken phase, and this is where bubble nucleation would occur. Now, and that's what we need, I said, for, for baryogenesis. Um, now, as you increase the mass of the Higgs boson in the standard model, it turns out that you start to move away from this kind of phase transition picture to this kind here, which is a second order phase transition. And it's one in which there's never a barrier between the two minima. And you never get this bubble nucleation in the second order transition. What we know from theory and experiment now is that the observed mass of the Higgs boson is too heavy uh, to live in this first order situation here. And just to give you some, uh, some, some results, here are different calculations that have been done using uh, Monte Carlo methods uh, that determine what's called the endpoint or the maximum mass of the Higgs to give a first order phase transition. And it is somewhere between 70 and 80 GeV, which is well below the 125 GeV of the, or 126 GeV of the observed Higgs uh, from the Large Hadron Collider. So we're certainly not in any situation close to this based on these, uh, you know, rigorous calculations in the standard model and the results from the Large Hadron Collider. So how would we ever imagine first order transition occurring at electroweak temperatures uh, it wouldn't happen in the standard model. What you need are new scalars beyond those of the standard model, new spin zero particles that bring us back from this kind of situation over here to this first order set of dynamics over here. And so that's really what the quest is to look for at the high energy collider are those new scalars that would do this job. And if they're there, then they might give us baryogenesis. They'll have implications for new particle searches at the Large Hadron Collider. There are other interesting possible implications, gravitational radiation. Uh, possibly they could be related to dark matter, but I won't be uh, able to have time to discuss about those possibilities. I'm going to just concentrate on these two. And one of, I think, the other interesting things about introducing new scalars uh, beyond the Higgs is that the way electroweak symmetry is broken uh, may be quite different than how we picture it in the standard model. And these new states 
may not only show up directly, but they may also modify in very subtle ways the properties of the Higgs from what's actually been measured thus far. So let me start with one example of a scenario where there's been a lot of work uh, to analyze the possible effects of new scalars, and that's the minimal supersymmetric standard model. And I don't have time to do a lot for you about supersymmetry, um, but I just I'll remind you if you haven't, uh, if you've already heard about it, and tell you if you haven't that one of the basic features of the minimal supersymmetric standard model is that it provides a partner for every standard model particle with complementary spin statistics. So an up quark, for example, has a spin zero partner called an up squark. Uh, the neutrino has a neutrino, snu trino super partner. The electroweak gauge bosons have gaugeino super partners that are spin a half, and so forth. One of them the new particles, the scalar particles, the superpartner, the scalar superpartner of the top quark may be one of these fields that could bring us back to a first order phase transfer. And that's been studied quite extensively, um, theoretically, and now there's experimental information to test this possibility. One of the possible complications when you have a scalar particle that uh, carries SU3 or color charge is that if it gets a vacuum expectation value, then the universe would carry color and electric charge. So you have to make sure that the parameters for the interactions of this particle don't land us in a color-breaking vacuum, that, uh, uh, but still bring us a first-order transition into what's called the Higgs phase today. So that's been studied, uh, what the constraints are on that possibility, and uh, without going into a lot of detail about the um, the scenario, here's a, a plot that shows as a function of one of the mass parameters in supersymmetry what the mass of that um, uh, scalar partner of the top quark would have to be to give a strong first order phase transition without breaking the color symmetry of, of the standard model. Uh, and it's somewhere on the order of 100 uh, GeV, just a little bit heavier than the Z. Uh, can't be too heavy, you don't get the strong first order phase transition, can't be too light or the universe breaks color. So it's quite constrained. People have looked for it at the Large Hadron Collider. There are plots that you'll see if you go on the what are called the wikis for the LHC that show the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle versus the mass of this stop. Uh, and these are some of the exclusion regions uh, where they've looked and haven't seen it uh, to make sure that the lightest supersymmetric particle is not colored. You have to lie below this dash curve here. Um, and where we're interested in is in this very light region over here, around 100 GeV. That's been studied using a technique called searching using monojets plus missing energy. And uh, here is the result, CMS preliminary result for that region that I've sort of blown up here. And again, here's where this dotted red line is. And basically, almost all of the parameter space uh, where you would like this particle to live to do the job has, has essentially been excluded up to some, some caveats, which I can discuss offline. So for many years, 20, maybe 20 years, people thought maybe supersymmetric particles would do the job, and it's not looking too good uh, for minimal supersymmetry and a first order phase transition. But that's only one of a plethora of possibilities. One of the more recent sort of paradigms that people are discussing and that I've been very interested in is something called the Higgs portal. Portal means doorway. And this really means new particles that may interact with the Higgs boson through a very simple interaction where I have two powers of the Higgs and two powers of some new particle called phi. And in this kind of Higgs portal scenario, the way we think about symmetry breaking might be a little more complicated than what happens in the single field uh, scenario in the standard model. So here's the phi direction and here's the Higgs direction. Here's the free energy. And the evolution of the potential energy with temperature uh, could be some complicated um, uh, surface in this uh, two-field two space. Now, what makes these uh, uh, Higgs portal scenarios particularly theoretically attractive is that you can look at them without all the paraphernalia of things like supersymmetry. And so I'm going to boil it down for you to one of the very simplest possibilities, which is to add just one new spin zero particle to the standard model that doesn't carry any quantum numbers of the standard model. It's called a singlet, and it could do the job for giving a first order phase transition. So back to our picture here. Um, we have a 
uh, think about how electroweak symmetry breaking occurred in the presence of this so-called singlet field. Um, in experiments, it would show up as uh, a pair of states that you might see at the Large Hadron Collider, one of which is like the standard model Higgs, the other is perhaps a little bit heavier. This is something that my collaborators and I studied several years ago, actually, just in published paper, I think just before or after I came and gave the colloquium here. So maybe I'll have another idea, at least when I come back from my next colloquium in two minutes. But, uh, uh, and what we did is we, we took the theory and we you know, scanned over all the parameters uh, using Monte Carlo and asked what were the values that would give you the first order phase transition that we need. And we represented the results in this two uh, parameter space of the masses of these two particles. The black dots correspond to all the sort of experimentally viable parameter points that might give a first order phase transition. Uh, what we now know is that the mass of one of them has to be 125 to 126 GeV, so you have to lie along this line here. But the mass of the second one could range anywhere from uh, hundreds of GeV up to uh, several hundred uh, GeV. There are signatures for this possibility that you might then look for at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and the way to organize how you think about that is in terms of what region of the mass parameter space you're in. If one of them is, if this new so-called singlet-like scalar is less than half the mass of the standard model Higgs, you would live over here. If it's uh, greater than twice the mass of the standard model Higgs, you would live over here. And there's a region where it uh, doesn't uh, uh, satisfy either of these uh, sort of um, constraints. Uh, and this is a really a region for not so much maybe the Large Hadron Collider as for uh, future high energy machines, which uh, I'll allude to shortly. Let's focus on this region here, which is a particularly interesting one where there might be a production of this new state at the Large Hadron Collider, and it would decay in a way that would lead to things that you wouldn't expect to otherwise see. For example, it might decay to two standard model like Higgses that each then decay in the way the standard model Higgs discover, a pair of B quarks and opposite sign tau leptons, for example. Uh, that would be a signature of living somewhere over here in this particular scenario. And that is certainly of something that appears to be discoverable in the next run of the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which is uh, uh, soon to start. Another possible signature is that the presence of this second state through uh, various changes in the, the, the theory could lead to a change in the way the Higgs boson interacts with itself. The standard model predicts the Higgs interacts with itself. This is called the trilinear coupling. And um, there's a prediction for what the value of that coupling is. It's very hard to measure at the Large Hadron Collider, but maybe um, you know at the end of the LHC era, we'll start to learn something uh, strongly about it. But the presence of this scenario could modify that coupling, which I call G111, quite significantly. Here's a plot that shows the critical temperature of the phase transition versus the value of G111. And the dots correspond to uh, values of these parameters that give the strong first order phase transition. So you can see this value right here is the standard model value. And you can see that there can be rather dramatic changes in the value of this self-interaction of the Higgs uh, if you have a strong first order phase transition. The colored bands correspond to different uh, percent changes. The purple is a sort of 50% change from the standard model value. The red is 30%, et cetera, et cetera. And these are um, deviations from the standard model value for this coupling that could be probed, perhaps at the life, uh, high luminosity era of the Large Hadron Collider, but certainly with future lepton machines and a future 100 GeV PT collider that people are starting to, uh, to think about. So modified Higgs self-interactions could be a way of probing uh, the possibility that there is a, a second state around that would, second scalar, that would give us this first order phase transition. Now, I want to talk about another paradigm, which is a little more complicated, but leads to a different pattern of how symmetry breaking could have occurred. And this involves introducing new scalars that are not what are called singlets under the standard model, but they interact with the Ws of the standard model and the photon. And the simplest example here is what's called a real triplet. It involves three states, one of which is neutral. And the neutral state, uh, in principle, could be a dark matter candidate and it leads to a possibility of what's called a two-step phase transition history. So the way to think about that here is back in our field space um, sort of uh, picture. Here's the Higgs direction. Here's the neutral triplet direction. And I'd like to look at this picture from the top down. 
So here's the origin, here's the h direction, and here's the sigma direction. And with the presence of this field, it's possible that electroweak symmetry could have been broken in two steps. First along the Higgs direction at some temperature, so the universe lives over here for a while. Then at a lower temperature, uh, and by the way, this is where baryogenesis would take place. So the bubble nucleation could nucleate into bubbles where the Higgs doesn't have a vacuum expectation value, but the triplet does. We make the baryon here. At a lower temperature, uh, we transition to the phase we live in, and so long as we don't dilute that away with too much entropy projection, uh, production, uh, we end up in a phase where this field could also then contribute to the dark matter as well as the baryon nucleus. So this is an idea, an example of a two-step phase transition, which is quite a novel sort of way of thinking about um, phase transition history in, in particle physics, and it's not something that you would ever see in the standard model. It's testable. How might you test it? Well, one way to test it is to look for the effects of the partners of this field, the neutral field. Those partners carry charge, and through virtual effects, they can modify the way the Higgs decays to two photons. So you can work out what the size of that the change is, and this is a really bad uh, projection of the plot that I can see clearly on my screen. You can't see, um, so I'm not going to talk you very much through it, but you can work out what the percent changes are in, from the standard model expectations for the Higgs decay uh, to two photons. And you can use that to probe the viability of this two-step phase transition. Um, so yeah, this is uh, an unfortunate uh, projection issue here. Uh, what we know, by the way, is right now it sort of looks like the standard model Higgs to two photon decay is, is at least consistent with the data. But there's a lot of uncertainty and some tension between the ATLAS and CMS uh, experiments. And so that leaves uh, a fair amount of room for a shift associated with these new states uh, to be seen in the future. I'm not going to, because of the way the projection looks here, I'm not going to go through um, some of those details. One other sort of possibility that I want to um, say a little bit about is, uh, is, is much more exotic. And it goes to a question that I've sort of gotten interested in recently, which is, do the symmetries of the standard model that we know are still good today, for example, uh, conservation or, or SC3 of color, do they always have to have been good symmetries in the early universe? We're used to thinking that as you cool down, you break symmetries, and that's that. But that doesn't always occur, actually, in nature. Um, there's an example from condensed matter systems called Rochelle salts. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Rochelle salts. Kind of, sort of. OK, good. All right. So I didn't know about this. But Rochelle salt uh, is a material that has a complicated chemical formula. And it becomes piezoelectric as you cool it down. So here's a plot that shows the piezoelectric activity of Rochelle salt as a function of temperature. So as you cool it down, it all of a sudden becomes piezoelectric. It's more ordered, less symmetric. Symmetry is broken. Cool it down further, it goes away. It returns to its symmetric state. Why couldn't that happen in particle physics? Well, some other people have asked this question, like Weinberg. And he pointed out that in gauge theories, this is certainly a possibility symmetry breaking and restoration as you cool. People have thought about it in other contexts. I've listed a few examples here. And we recently um, explored this possibility for SD3 of color uh, in the standard model and asked the question, could this have occurred for QCD? Uh, in other words, could there have been a period when the gluons, because of symmetry breaking, became massive? They're not today. And as you cool down further, they become massive, which is what we know is consistent with today's experiments. Well, uh, you can illustrate that this actually could happen in a simple extension with three scalars that carry color. It's called a colored triplet. Um, and again, without going through a lot of details, the way symmetry breaking would occur in this paradigm is you start at high temperature with everything symmetric. There's a, a breaking of the color symmetry where gluons become massive. At lower temperature, they become massless again. And uh, you may be able to do your baryogenesis with this color breaking. History. You can look for these particles at the Large Hadron Collider, and uh, there are limits on their masses, but it's an interesting uh, possibility, at least, to think about. Maybe it wasn't so simple. So moral of the story, electroweak symmetry breaking. Was it so simple and direct? I don't think it had to have been. Uh, can you extend the scalar sector to get 
the phase transition pattern for baryogenesis that you need. Well, if you do that, you just might have really interesting patterns of electroweak symmetry breaking, new pathways to baryogenesis, and lots of interesting signatures to look for in the high energy experiment. So let me come to, in the last maybe five-ish plus minutes, uh, a sh little short version of uh, this other sort of possibility uh, or other avenue for probing uh, weak scale baryogenesis, which is uh, CP violation um, uh, and electric dipole moments. So let me remind you, the CP violation comes in in these bubbles uh, through interactions at the bubble wall. And uh, the, their effect is really, at the end of the day, a result of a competition of three different pieces of physics. The CP violation that leads to asymmetries between interactions of particles and antiparticles, chemical equilibration that causes particle number to convert from one species into another, and the physics of diffusion of those particle densities ahead of this bubble wall. If you analyze this carefully, you have to write down, for example, in the supersymmetric uh, version of the standard model, a large number of equations. 30, I'm not going to write down equations. Here's the analogy to describe what you analyze is the London underground. And uh, I didn't invent this, one of my former postdocs did. But the idea is you've got, uh, you know, CP violation sort of at the source here. You want to get the baryon asymmetry out over here. And there are lots of different pathways that this could go through. And it's certainly a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a large amount of CP violation. But all the pathways to turn it into baryons have to be sufficiently viable. Okay? So there's actually a lot of physics that goes into analyzing this kind of uh, piece of the problem. Uh, what you get out of it are uh, things that look like the following. This is a plot of the number density of different kinds of standard model particles that come at the end of this chain of uh, underground as a function of their distance inside to outside the bubble. Over here is inside the bubble, out here is outside the bubble. And this red curve, for example, is the total number density of left-handed fermions in the standard model, which is just what's needed to cause those spalerons to tilt and run in one direction. Okay? So this tail has to be large enough to cause that to happen. The CP violating effect is really strong right here at the bubble wall. And so this is where we have to focus our attention for experiment is, does the CP violation give enough kick to this system uh, to generate the observed baryon asymmetry at the end of the day. Experimentally, how do you look for it? Well, uh, the most powerful way is to look for permanent electric dipole moments of elementary particles or systems. And this is a, an endeavor that started in the 50s uh, with Norman Ramsey and his collaborators at uh, Harvard. They published their first limit on the electric dipole moment of the neutron in 1957. Uh, they actually started the experiment in 1950, and they were sort of discouraged because some theorists, Li and Yang, told them that it was not very interesting. There was not going to be any violation of actually parity is what they were looking for, uh, parity violation in the strong interactions. And Li and Ye Yang said, forget it. So they, they sat on their result and didn't publish. And then along came uh, Madame Wu et al. and the observation of parity violation in the beta decay of cobalt-60. and uh, Letterman and company in the observation of parity violation in pi and decay. And uh, then Norman Ramsey and collaborators said, well, maybe we better publish our results after all, 1957. And they said, by the way, uh, the theorists do say there are arguments against the neutron having an electric dipole moment uh, associated with time reversal uh, invariants, but those aren't the really interesting ones. The ones are parity. Well, today we're interested in time reversal violations or CP violations, but uh, that was the history. Experiments have come a long way. Whoops, something crashed on me. It's probably something I should end my talk. I'm not going to sing. Oh, that's so loud. 